Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue the series of Patreon AMA sessions. It's February 7th, 2021 edition. We'll continue discussion with the members of the School for Bain Texts. So remember, you can join us there for as little as just $2 per month. Link to my Patreon is in the video description. So in addition to getting to participate in the AMA sessions by submitting uh, questions like the ones you'll see featured in this video, another great thing, by the way, about being a member of the school is you'll get to actually discuss with the other school members in the group chat on Discord. This is something I got a comment just today um, saying that would be great. Well, you're absolutely right about that. And in fact, uh, some of the school members have already sort of stepped up and helped me set this up. And I promise you what you'll find on Discord right now uh, in this channel is far more interesting than anything going on on a um, academic conference or within a graduate school uh, seminar boardroom meeting or all of the other things which actually are not happening on college campuses because with the lockdown, you're not allowed to be there. So um, you could go $50,000 peer in student loan debt to watch free YouTube videos, including ones from the Chad Hague channel itself, as ironic as that might be, or you could do the real thing, okay? You could, um, just for a few dollars per month, uh, get a better education than a top PhD program, including, by the way, developing the skill of writing. So at least back in the day when they still made you do work on college campuses and still wanted to teach you something, one of the um, reasons to go through that whole experience was precisely to develop your skills as a writer and, of course, PhD level, developing your, your skills as, as a scholar. And that's something which we also are doing within the school itself. The first essay over um, one particular topic from uh, Ted Kuczynski's Industrial Society and its Future is due within the school right about now. I've already gotten um, a submission or two uh, from the students, and these will be submitted for peer review. And um, it, the experience really of getting to collaborate and build up your skills as a scholar is something which I argue you'll be able to do much better here. I say this as somebody who has, in fact, basically written several dissertations. When I dropped out of um, graduate school seven years ago, I, I kind of had this sense of regret that I would never um, get to write a dissertation, um, not knowing that, in fact, I would. I would just do it as a ghostwriter for pay for several other people, which, of course, you know, is an interesting um, uh, subject in itself for another video, but I can promise you as somebody who knows that world, I would argue pretty well that what we're doing here on um, Patreon and on Discord and on YouTube, this is the real thing. So once again, if you haven't done so already, I'd recommend you for just a few dollars per month to uh, become a part of this. And I also wanted to apologize for the slight delay in videos as I was sick the past week. Um, with something which I don't really know what it was. It wasn't quite like anything I've ever had before. It might have been, you know what, as some people have said. I'm not going to formally speculate on that, but I will say that I'm better now and I'm fully ready to get back into producing the videos. And I thank you all for your patience. So the first question this week is, in regards to John Michael Greer's Retro Future, I've recently purchased this book and begun reading it. I'm only about halfway through it so far, but I have a question that relates to him and Kaczynski in particular. Greer seems to be advocating for a deliberate return to a society that uses less technology, but through overtly political means. But could that realistically be done? Such a concept runs quite counter to Kaczynski's own theory of self-propagating systems. I personally believe Kaczynski would say that winding back the technology technological system through political or really any other means would not even be possible due to the nature of the technological system to always grow and need more. So this is a great question, which you could probably write a whole book about all of the differences between uh, Greer's approach and Kaczynski's approach, and it would be a long book at that. So I'm going to mostly focus in my response on things that you brought up yourself uh, with regard to um, not just the nature of technology, but the nature of all self-propagating systems. Why that negates in advance any vision to consciously steer it in a certain direction, especially the direction going backwards. And it's really not an exaggeration to say that Greer is interested in going back because, after all, the book is quite literally called The Retro Future, looking to the past to remake the future. This is, by the way, um, a philosophical or nonfiction version of a novel which Greer wrote called Retrotopia, in which, in the fictional version, he portrays this idea through the story 
of a guy who travels from Philadelphia to Toledo in the year 2065 at a time when the United States as such no longer exists. At that time, um, Toledo is part of a new nation called the Lakeland Republic. And what the traveler finds when he gets there is just that the average person gets a higher standard of living simply through using tools which would be considered out of date today, but are still perfectly functional. And by the way, less expensive in real terms of things like ecological damage, um, fossil fuel inputs, they don't require global distribution networks, and they're also just plain more satisfying and enjoyable to use. People feel, however, that it's not even possible simply because the one thing they feel they can't do is turn back the hands of time. Except, of course, on daylight savings, where that's quite literally what they do with their clocks at home, but they still feel like it's not even possible. But Greer simply um, interprets this as a feeling of learned helplessness, which is just a very unclear way of saying that corporate marketers told me to buy something else. (laughs) So um, a a big part of his philosophy here is that technology in the singular doesn't even exist. Okay, In reality, there's a plurality of different technologies, and anyone who really is a free subject would be able to choose which one they want, even if it's not currently trending as the latest thing. Okay, And people only feel that that's not even an option because... Um, corporate marketers have quite literally used black magic to um, manipulate people into spending money they don't have for stupid things they don't even want simply because people lack the spiritual strength to say no. And we don't even have to wait for some hypothetical situation in the far future to see what this would look like because if you just travel to the so-called third world, you'll see on a mass scale, on a daily basis, exactly what this would look like. My own village in rural India, for example, is a place where I violate the law, thou shalt not use an outdated tool every single day, and I'm quite happy to do it. For example, I shower with well water from my own land because there is no city water grid. I heat it up during the cold monsoon season outdoors um, over firewood because there is no natural gas grid, or if it's the hot season, I just shower with cold water or uh, room temperature water, and I use a bucket instead of a shower head because you actually waste less water that way. And so things which would not even seem possible to a suburbanite living in the United States who would insist on a hot shower with water from the processing plant um, in the city um, and natural gas, which is uh, piped in from some distant location, um, it wouldn't even seem possible. But it's actually more enjoyable, far less expensive. There's really not even a water bill to anyone there because you're just getting it from nature. And it also makes you more responsible because you understand that this isn't coming from some hypothetical infinite source which the state is paying for. It's coming from an aquifer which during the dry season can indeed go dry. I remember right before the lockdown began, I went to a college in rural Tamil Nadu for a conference where I was given like uh, less than 24 hours notice. Um, Somebody else uh, couldn't show up. So they took me out there and um, there was... um, no water in the well for the for the campus. So um, instead of uh, being able to wash your hands with water from the tap, they they had a bucket. Okay, and you would just use a, a little, basically a little cup to uh, only use as much water as you need. And you know that's perfectly fine because that's a a technology which would be considered out of date today but is still perfectly functional and actually makes you a better person because you realize that the aquifer um, had indeed basically uh, the uh, the source for the well water had basically gone dry during the dry season. And you should always be cautious with how much of it you use. So this idea that even though I can see with my own eyes that it's more enjoyable, it makes you a better person, um, and it's less damaging to the environment, etc. It still can't be done simply because technology in the singular is something other than that. And whatever is um, has come before it has been systematically devalued to the point that um, it's not even an option to use it anymore. Habermas compares um, this sort of technological progress to Piaget's stages of learning, in which once you advance to another stage in Piaget's sort of hierarchy of of cognitive um, development, there's not even an option to go backwards. And Habermas uh, makes that claim with political systems as well. You could never go back to um, a theocratic monarchy 
after you've had democracy. And similarly with um, technology, you can never go back to uh, using a bucket and well water once you've had a hot shower in a suburban bathroom in the United States, right? Um, and you could also do this with uh, just one more quick example with food. You know, I mean, that's a really touchy subject, uh, especially for Westerners with their extremely over sanitized environments where everything has to be exactly the right temperature exactly the right time. But I found in India that um, fish curry, for example, is actually better stored on the counter in a clay jar, a clay pot, basically, uh, without refrigeration. You actually get better flavors over time with all the spice, etc. Um, if you leave it on the counter for, say, you know, I don't know, like up to 48 hours or something like that, if you were to just throw that into the fridge immediately as the health inspectors in the United States would force you to do, you would actually kind of ruin it, okay? And it's really not that radical. This is the way it's been done for like hundreds of years here in India. So I'm someone who lives this out on a daily basis, the idea that you can have a higher standard of living simply by um, doing things the way they were done, like, I don't know, you know, in the 1950s or a little earlier. I mean, we're certainly not going all the way back to the Stone Age here. And this is something which Greer, once again, um, explains through properly occult means as a, a, a feeling that the black magic of corporate marketers is something we can't resist, okay? And the idea that I need no further explanation than that some corporate marketer said I have to buy this is, of course, um, said by the same secularist, uh, so-called rationalists, who would um, laugh at a traditionalist Roman Catholic saying the same thing about the Vatican? The traditionalist Catholic who says, I need no further explanation than the, that the Pope said it, um, is really not that different from the uh, clueless suburbanite in the first world who says, I need no further explanation than that Apple told me to buy that, or fill in the blank with some other um, self-interested uh, corporation. And um, that is indeed something worthy of consideration. Now, Kaczynski differs from Greer in that as a materialist, he's not really interested in the occult sort of explanation. And as a rationalist, he argues that you can actually understand technology better precisely by um, understanding the laws of all self-propagating systems. So a self-propagating system in anti-tech revolution, why and how, is um, a system which is uh, hardwired to um, outcompete rivals within a, a context of natural selection um, with, according to a set of uh, rationalized laws which apply equally well to uh, viruses, which are not even alive, or to, of course, human empires, which, which are composed of living things, or, you know, buffalo herds, uh, things like that, um, animal populations, or even to uh, robots, which are also not alive. And you'll understand technology better if you understand those rationalized laws um, without all of the sort of baggage that we, we put into technology, which um, causes people like Ray Kurzweil to assume, well, obviously technology will always go out of its way to keep me alive because that's what technology does is it serves man's wishes. Um, it's that sort of distortion which um, Kaczynski tries to uh, disabuse the reader of by focusing on the, the rationalized laws instead. And what he found is that it is the nature of self-propagating systems to favor behaviors which give a short-term competitive advantage over rivals within the context of natural selection, even if the long-term consequences prove to be negative or even, in fact, self-destructive. He gave the example of a group of rival uh, tribes who are forest clearers show that if one of them realized it could clear so much forest land, in fact, that it would gain an advantage over the others to basically put them out of business, uh, so to speak. Um, even if the long-term consequence was its own self-destruction, it would still choose to do that because that's just the nature of self-propagating systems. And that is not merely metaphorical, by the way, for the kind of things which the global technological system does on a daily basis because all of these radically, historically unprecedented interventions on ecological grounds will also have the long-term effect of, as Kaczynski says himself, inevitably self-destructing the technological system itself. He noted in the second chapter of Antitech Revolution, Why and How, that the real explanation for Fermi's paradox or the um, question why it is that with all of the billions of years that, you know, things have existed and all of the countless, um, you know, galaxies, etc. out there, there should be on purely rational grounds, um, evidence of intergalactic space travel in that some civilization on a distant planet should have already been smart enough to do it, um, but we've never seen any evidence. And the explanation which Kaczynski gives is that um, by the laws of self-propagating systems alone, 
any technological civilization which could have been advanced enough to do intergalactic space travel would have already self-destructed before then. There's a kind of clear trajectory there, a clear succession of stages in which self-destruction comes first. Uh, but the point is that self-destruction is a hardwired outcome, and it's only people who really don't have any engagement with anything natural who could um, uh, believe or fall for the delusion that they could have endless ecological disruptions without ever facing any consequences for it. So Kaczynski argued for this reason that there really is no alternative short of revolution. You can have a reformation of the technological system in which you simply make it green by the laughable standards of SJWs or Democrat Party politicians or corporate CEOs, whatever version of um, uh, pumping tax dollars into solar panel companies or funding um, elite professors on Ivy League campuses to teach ridiculous seminars on uh, making their campus green, whatever um, they think is going to be a solution, um, really will not even begin to um, reverse this trajectory because the technological system as a self-propagating system is only going to allow activities which are progressing towards that endpoint of self-destruction in disguise, however they might be um, deceptively marketed on the surface level. So for this reason, he says, no, there is no alternative to revolution. And by that, he's not meaning political revolution of changing the party of the president of the United States or of the majority in Congress. Um, he meant a real revolution in which you, you no longer have the self-propagating system itself. And of course, that is extremely controversial, but he had good reasons for um, uh, favoring that stance. The really, I think the question between Greer and Kaczynski is ecological in nature, uh, but in a sense which is quite subtle. So for um, someone like John Michael Greer, it is not simply the phenomenological problem of, well, what you're really conscious of is fossil fuels. That's kind of the, the Michael Rupert slash early Chad Haig um, perspective. For Greer, it's a little bit more complicated than that because the idea that we misrecognize what are in reality a set of ways of burning fossil fuels out of existence, for Greer is an ecological misunderstanding. So the abstraction of technology can progress infinitely um, is something which Greer would explain as misguided simply because it does not recognize how that progress is a smaller part of a broader ecological whole in which um, stealing uh, concentrated energy reserves, which nature had already provided in the first place without any input on the part of man, is misunderstood as some manifestation of our own brilliance, our own power, our own unbridled freedom, etc. So for Greer, it's the misunderstanding of how parts and holes function on a properly ecological level, which, um, which accounts for the idea that technological progress will be infinite, which Greer absolutely does not believe. For him, this is a temporary phenomenon in which there was a certain surplus of energy from hundreds of millions of years of natural processes uh, providing these fossil fuel reserves. And um, the temporary historical anomaly of uh, putting that to use, which admittedly we've been able to do, um, will have the same ending really as uh, if a group of field mice had one day accidentally found a truckload of grain had overturned within their um, habitat, they would uh, have a temporary surplus in the population because there would be more food than usual. Then they would eat through that excess and then they would have a massive die off simply because on ecological grounds, there would be no way to materially support that huge overpopulation, and then they would go back to whatever much more modest population could be sustained in that habitat. And everybody can understand how that works for a group of field mice, but even the top, you know, IQs or whatever in the world cannot understand the same problem when it comes to humans because of an ecological misunderstanding in which, oh no, the, the rules of parts and holes which apply to field mice don't apply to us because it's not just uh, fossil fuels. It's our brilliance and power and freedom. And even if you phrase this in terms of the technological systems, unbridled power, 
um, et cetera, you're still basically misunderstanding the ecological problem here of parts and wholes because the technological system itself is only able to function because it taps into the, those same resources, says Greer. So the last thing I wanted to address is, of course, the question, can this realistically be done? Because another um, part of Kaczynski's critique of any attempt to steer the direction of a self-propagating system is his skepticism about whether humans can, um, uh, can make or engineer historical changes in advance to conform exactly to their vision of how it's supposed to unfold. And in the first chapter of Anti-Tech Revolution, he provides kind of rationalized laws for why that's impossible. He notes things like you can't have a self-predicting social system because that would violate Russell's paradox in which a formal system can't use its own resources to talk about itself. You can't have perfect predictions because um, the data would have to be both extraordinarily large um, in number and also perfectly accurate because the slightest inaccuracy could, um, you know, cause some, he talked about like the, the butterfly effects where a butterfly flaps its wings in Brazil and then you have a tornado in Texas. So he notes that um, you can't actually have any human, however seemingly powerful they might be, even like a literal emperor or in our era, um, president of the United States cannot steer um, especially social system in any particular direction because you're dealing with a, a complex system in which you have emergent properties, you have complex feedback loops, you have a plurality of, um, of agents with uh, adaptability, um, etc. We know all of these laws pretty well. So um, Kaczynski's skepticism that anybody could engineer, even a society that's trying to do the right thing, could we really have a society in which people are forced to use, quote unquote, outdated tools simply because it's the better option? Is that really possible? The criticism of Lincoln, as we'll discuss, of course, in the next question as well, that I get from various comments on YouTube on the videos I've done on the topic, people saying, isn't Lincoln's attempt to engineer a sort of green police state in which people are forced to live ecologically just another violation of Kaczynski's warning that no social system can be engineered um, in advance, because even if big historical changes do occur, they don't unfold exactly the way that somebody had planned that they would. The greatest example of this is, of course, the technological revolution itself. There were intellectuals in the 18th century who figured that, of course, if universal automation happened, people would no longer have to spend hours and hours every day with um, time-consuming manual labor tasks like you know, farming or grinding enough grain for the next uh, day's bread took women in Jesus era in the ancient world, like three hours of, of labor every day. So intellectuals in the Enlightenment era said, well, if we didn't have to do that, everybody could basically be freed up to write classical music or like Renaissance era poetry. Everybody could become a Mozart or a Shakespeare. Well, the automation did happen, but the result was certainly not that. Instead, you had the massive problem of boredom from having nothing to do, and it was largely filled with the lowest common denominator of garbage, like reality TV and pop music and things like that. So instead of allowing everybody to write um, an epic poem like The Fairy Queen by Spencer, people wasted their lives following every move by Kim Kardashian or listening to really bad music from someone like uh, Justin Bieber or Ariana Grande. So you had the major um, social change, uh, but it didn't unfold the way that people had predicted. Even people who basically, you know, they're the most intelligent people in the earth, basically, or the Enlightenment era intellectuals, they got it wrong. And no matter how seemingly intelligent anybody who um, seems to be uh, uh, in control of the situation they might be, if they gamble on making enormous changes, they will not unfold the way that they predicted as well. So does this apply even to um, changes which uh, would be good, like uh, having people live more ecologically? Could you actually engineer a society in which you force them to do so? Well, that's not really what Greer is talking about. Greer is not the sort of green police state guy like Lincoln admittedly is. He's really more the ecological thinker who says that people will largely use older technologies in the, f in the future because the ecological conditions for them to not do so will have disappeared. 
I think Greer's critique of the problem of overpopulation is uh, quite useful here because he noted that we've already had decades and decades of formal attempts to stop overpopulation through, you know, educating people about it and uh, uh, making birth control and things like that readily available. We've already had these attempts, um, but the Earth still reached 7 billion people. And that was simply because humans really aren't that different from um you know, like I think he compared them to yeast. If you have a certain excess of um, feeding material in a environment, um, they're going to uh, multiply. And that's what um, really was the explanation of this, was simply the excess provided by, once again, fossil fuels. But he doesn't really mean that in the, the Michael Rupert or even the early Chad Haig sense of, um, you know, the, the phenomenology of which you're aware of is simply, no, he really means it in um, the part-whole relation sense that because within the whole there was um, a temporary surplus of, of feeding material, you had a rise in population, but you vastly misunderstand the situation if you think that that will continue even after that surplus is gone, which is quite literally what um, virtually everybody, even like, uh, you know, the so-called top IQs in the world today, um, believe. They believe even after the fossil fuels are gone, you'll still have this problem of overpopulation, yet that is simply um, ecological misunderstanding. For Greer, it's basically the same thing with um, technology. Uh, you you won't have the luxury of having um, the uh, even like the, the level of internet which we take for granted today. There is no internet in um, the Lakeland Republic in Retrotopia. Um, people ha instead get their news from daily newspapers. They um, <laughs> write things on paper because the ecological conditions to have this kind of um, global smartphone zombie population, which is constantly online for free, apparently, um, that's not even an option in the far future for properly ecological reasons. So it's a very subtle distinction, but one well worth considering. So the next question is, I've recently been thinking about bridges between Lincoln and Wittgenstein out of all things. Wittgenstein argues throughout his work that many of the philosophical problems arise out of language being ripped from its ordinary use and instead being contorted to create various puzzles about knowledge, truth, mind, justice, reference, and so on. As he put it himself, they arise from language going on holiday. In this case, words no longer carry their ordinary efficacy that they've been endowed with when being said to actually get things done in our everyday go about. So, for instance, the word no has a proper place when accusing someone of knowing what they were doing, etc., and is only when disconnected from such concrete uses of the word that philosophers can start to contort the concept of knowledge into various sprawling and ever more abstract epistemological systems as such is my own addition. I wonder what the link between this Wittgensteinian notion of language being abused and uh, Linkola's notion of language's inherent stretchiness when depicting ecologically impossible objects uh, might be. It seems to me that talk about ecologically impossible objects arise precisely when language goes on holiday from actually contributing to our survival, or rather that language becomes estranged from the way of speaking that one would carry out when tilling the soil, harvesting crops, organizing a hunt, storing food, building shelter, and so on. When language, as we carry it out in our everyday life, is no longer anchored in carrying out practices that are well aware of ecological limitations, then language, too, becomes detached from respecting such limitations. Dear Mr. Haig, would you care to do some elaboration on Linkola's philosophy of language someday? It tends to come up every time one talks about philosophy, but I think it could be fleshed out into a concept of its own. So this is a very interesting question, which deals with a lot of things which I also considered to be really important about a year ago when I wrote the fifth book, The Later Philosophy of Penti Linkola, even to the extent that uh, the whole uh, lengthy third chapter of that book was pretty much devoted to the problem of language and ecologically impossible objects is referenced within this question. Um, the thing which I didn't do, admittedly, when I wrote that was consider the relation to Wittgenstein. Um, and the reason for that was, to be perfectly honest with you, I've never really studied Wittgenstein on a formal, like, academic level. Now, I had the opportunity. There was a senior-level um, seminar when I was an undergrad on Wittgenstein, I think specifically on maybe, like, the later Wittgenstein. I don't really remember because I didn't take it. And the reason for that was I was influenced by one professor on campus who was still... I guess maybe living in the 1960s when the feud between the continental thinkers who were, um, you know, dominant in, I guess, Northwestern is where he attended in the 60s, 
and as they called them, the analytic philosophers, who, um, you know, of course, uh, Wittgenstein is uh, counted among, uh, were still pretty strong. And obviously, people leave YouTube comments now saying, well, that, that, that distinction basically doesn't exist anymore. That feud is from generations ago. But at least when I was an undergrad, I was still definitely influenced by people for whom this uh, um, competition was still quite real. So a lot of what I know about Wittgenstein actually comes more from like the YouTube audience. And I remember there was one YouTube commenter who brought up Wittgenstein about two years ago when I was first kind of promoting the theory of memology, my own theory that um, if you examine the, the layers of consciousness, there's an underlying shape which distorts language itself to the point that you don't really have any neutral concepts. You might have a word like perfection, but on a purely linguistic level, you can't really know what kind of perfection somebody is talking about unless you have um, access to the underlying deep meme, which will inevitably influence how they understand that linguistic concept uh, to function. So perfection for someone in the medieval era was, of course, completeness. God is already completely perfect. There's no need for him to become any more perfect, for that would be a misunderstanding of the term, said Thomas Aquinas. But that is, of course, because he was an agrarian medieval thinker for whom the underlying shape, um, uh, a layer below language, was that of the agrarian circle. For someone in our era, of course, perfection cannot be something already complete because that's anticlimactic. We need something which only ever becomes more perfect because the underlying shape below the level of language is, of course, um, the deep meme of the arrow of progress. So when I brought up this critique of the linguistic turn, that language is not enough because nobody ever simply uses language. They always have some uh, geometrical distortion in the background. I was kind of surprised that um, one subscriber with a very good background in analytic philosophy um, said, well, that's actually kind of like Wittgenstein, because Wittgenstein, despite the fact that he's often portrayed as the guy who obsessed with language games to the point that that sort of um, became a thing in academia that just went on and on and on trying to <laughs> understand how language games function. This is why in the 1980s, Badiou kind of um, tried to put a halt on that and said, no, 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 enough about language games. Let's talk about set theory, etc. Um, it's interesting that Wittgenstein also basically had this idea that when you have language in use, you actually do have a reference to something beyond the word itself, which influences how that word is understood by the person speaking. Um, for example, when f people talk about time, they aren't simply using the linguistic concept. They actually have something like a, a picture kind of in their mind of what they mean by that. And um, the subscriber noted that Wittgenstein concluded that philosophers get into these um, extremely sophisticated um, arguments about what time actually is precisely because they have different pictures. They, they, they're using the same word on a linguistic level. Um, but the, the picture that they're referring it to um, is, is different. Okay, Maybe this is accounting for the way that Heidegger is deconstructing the vulgar concept of time, which you find um, all the way up to Hegel, whatever. He's saying, well, it, Wittgenstein I, w rather would say, well, they just have different pictures. Okay? The, the argument is not simply about the language, but about this other thing which it's referring to. So if we tie this in with Linkola, I think it would be useful to say that for Linkola, you can only have this kind of abuse of language, which is recognized by the, the, the patron who posed the question here, as something of a secondary deviation from the ordinary way that it would be used. Um, you, you only really have that when you first have a certain um, separation from the ordinary activities of tilling the soil, harvesting crops, organizing a hunt, storing food, building shelters, so on. When you no longer do these traditional activities, which were basically directly related to going through the power process to satisfy serious needs of things like food, shelter, water, etc., um, when you no longer have those um, lived contexts of going through the power process and instead with technological automation forcing you to basically be idle all the time, um, 
yet still ironically totally consumed in arbitrary work um, to earn the paycheck, to be able to pay all of the outrageous bills to survive as a first world suburbanite. Um, you, you have this disconnect, which allows the opportunity for language to begin to refer to things which could never actually exist. And because you are no longer within the context in which ecological limitations could be phenomenologically registered within consciousness as real because you basically live an artificial existence of perpetual idling. Um, it's only then that language is allowed to talk about things like universal automation, universal sanitation, universal animal rights to the point that you literally can't even kill a um, a rat. <laughs> you know, you have massive rat overpopulation due to the amount of garbage which the human overpopulation at first provided, and yet you have extreme so-called environmentalists forbidding you to kill even one rat. And if you post a video on YouTube, even as a farmer in the third world, of humanely drowning a rat in a bucket of water, it will be removed from YouTube by the same first world suburbanites who would probably call exterminators to spray toxic chemicals in their houses if they saw a single cockroach crawling on the ground. But nonetheless, you can, um, you can not simply blame language for allowing this monstrosity because you had to first be divorced from the proper context of living naturally. Because if you took a hunter-gatherer from, say, the prehistoric era, and even if you didn't have any um, communicative issues with regard to language, you could not use language to explain to them what all of these ecologically impossible objects actually are. You could not use language to explain to such a person what universal automation, universal sanitation, um, universal animal rights, global overpopulation, um, what these things are. Not because they maybe wouldn't understand it linguistically, but rather because they know that that is out of accord with the picture which they have in their minds, and they would realize, I guess on a deeper level, that it wouldn't be possible within the ecological limitations of nature, precisely because the kind of activities they'd be consumed with um, on a physical level, like hunting wild animals, um, and maintaining safety from dangers in the in the wild, etc., they would realize that the kind of things you're talking about contradict natural law. The question, I think, really is just what the underlying picture might be for the modern first world suburbanite technophile who who thinks not only that all of these ecologically impossible objects are realistic, like the, the Kurzweilian singularity, for example, but actually argue that they're the only options. Um, it's not even an option today to be an agrarian peasant, a hunter-gatherer, a nomadic herdsman, etc., despite the fact that actually there are such people alive even today, they would say, no, no, it's not possible because the underlying picture in my mind says so. What is that picture, though? Certainly my earliest philosophy, I would say it's just the deep meme of fossil fuel-based progress. You have an arrow that never plateaus and never reverses, certainly. And in my earliest philosophy, I would say that's sufficient to account for all of these uh, instances of ecological impossibility. And in a certain sense, you do have a common denominator in Linkola's philosophy that all of these do kind of gesture towards an irrational expectation of, of something that never really stops growing. He says himself, when people talk about utopia with language, what they really have at the picture level, to use Wittgenstein's term, is an economy that never shrinks. It just perpetually grows, and it's never um, bothered by problems like uh, running out of resources or uh, polluting its own environment to the point that it really causes problems. Um, so you have that. You have, of course, the tendency for uh, there to be more automation which e with each year, more sanitation, more population, etc. So you do have, um, I think, grounds for saying that the picture, which allows this distortion to go on, simply is the picture of the arrow of progress. Um, but I don't know if that's um, really all that you can say about the kinds of things which Alinkola is talking about. I think in many ways it's actually a negation. I think that in many ways it's not so much that it's conforming to a strict picture which they explicitly understand so much as the kind of people who could believe such nonsense are people who have a certain void 
within their own minds. This is kind of my own later philosophy as well with By Hermeneutical Death, the sixth book. It's, it's not so much anymore just that you have a hermeneutical interpretation in accord with a, a certain geometrical shape as so much as when technolog uh, technological progress reaches a certain point, you lose the deep meme altogether, and then you simply become a passive recipient of simulations, okay? And in a lot of ways, the kinds of things which Linkola talks about as ecologically impossible objects are the kinds of things which you'd have to be a purely passive subject um, who simply accepts whatever the technological system gives it um, to, to be able to uh, parrot these things as realistic because you really have to not even be a thinking subject at all to believe um, the kinds of outrageous proposals which are um, taken all too seriously by, you know, credible so-called uh, figures within the media, the academic industry, um, the entertainment industry, etc. And this makes sense because if you actually compare the kinds of activities which are mentioned here, like tilling the soil, harvesting crops, organizing a hunt, um, storing food, building shelter, those are actually positive activities. There's actually something concrete there as far as going through the power process correctly, um, because if you don't do it correctly, you'll die. Okay, If you don't um, grow your crops um, correctly as a farmer, you're going to uh, starve and you will die if you... Um, don't uh, go through the process of hunting wild animals correctly. That's another situation in which there could be some real dangers that are quite, quite literally fatal. Okay, especially if you talking about way back, like in, in the pre prehistoric era, you know, hunting woolly mammoths and things like that. So there really is a certain accountability which you have with activities like that, in which you know you really do have to do it right at a positive level, or you die. Whereas if you're living as an, an idler who's literally not doing anything except consuming simulations on both on smartphone screens, but also just the objects you deal with are simulations like uh, the food you eat isn't even really what it um, looks like. It's simply a bundle of super cheap materials which have been artificially engineered to taste like some other thing, um, which they are not. You look at like uh, the uh, sandwiches from fast food drive throughs in the United States, which include a lot of really weird ingredients, which are not simply meat, cheese, um, bread, not in the traditional sense anyway, etc. So um, you're consuming simulations to the point that you're actually, your entire existence is a void. You're not really doing anything. You're not really dealing with anything. It's just a bunch of simulations. And I think it's the, the negativity of such a person which would allow the um, ecological impossibility to pass as real because that is also, at the end of the day, nothing. It, it's quite literally nothing because uh, for Linkola to be is to be ecological and something which is ecologically impossible um, has failed the, the most basic uh, standard of ontological viability to the point that it does not even have any being. Next question is, I was wondering as to your take on whether cinema warrants the title of fine art akin to, say, classical music or paintings, and thus deserves some degree of exemption from the general condemnation of modern technology. I, for better or worse, have indeed found that a few of my more meaningful experiences in life have been through film as an art medium. But I also see many of my friends and family fall prey to the silver screen's predatory mainstream consumerist shit, the content that everyone hates the least, and hence openly receive Trojan horses worth of variegated propaganda as a result. Should cinema be considered redeemable? So this is a great question, which is not at all easy to answer without some qualifications, because... Um, obviously, cinema in itself is kind of um, a very broad term these days um, when so much of electronic um, media is simply consumed on smartphones with the lockdown and theaters being closed. It's to the point now when major Hollywood movie comes out, it just goes straight to somebody's smartphone. And yet, in a certain sense, that's still cinema, even though I think cinema originally referred to the building, right? Because at least here in India, I think... Uh, if you talk about going out to the theater, you say, we'll go out to the cinema, something like that, right? So it's, it's kind of a, um, a complicated uh, situation where the term once referred to the experience of actually going out to that place and watching it in person, but um, it also refers to the concept of watching a pre-recorded video, um, which really is, of course, technological because, um, you know, there is no way to access the 
um, video itself, except through the detour of using some form of modern technology, especially now when even in 2012, the film companies themselves declared bankruptcy. What I mean by that is not the um, studios, whatever that produce the movies. I'm talking about the, uh, the, the companies that pr uh, would manufacture the physical film, which used to be used to make movies. They declared bankruptcy in 2012 because it had gone all digital. So at this point, cinema um, really is uh, impossible to think of outside of modern technology. And there's also a huge difference between you know, cinema in the sense of Alfred Hitchcock's films in the, the 1940s or like even really good television shows like uh, Alfred Hitchcock Presents or The Twilight Zone. Um, massive difference between that and at least what I saw on television by, you know, the year 2008. The last time I owned a television was some years back, but I remember in like, say, the, the late 2000s, early 2010s, if you turn on the TV, um, you wouldn't even find anything like cinema in that sense. You wouldn't even find the, um, the sort of uh, drama with uh, character development, a plot line, etc. You would just see a bunch of reality TV. Even if you turn on a channel which used to feature like educational documentaries, if you turn on like the History Channel, um, you'll just see a bunch of uh, reality shows about pawn shops, right? If you turn on the Discovery Channel, you'll just see, you know, guys driving trucks in Alaska or something. You turn on TLC, you would see Honey Boo Boo or whatever that weird ass uh, show was called. And it's to the point, I think, where um, it's it's no longer even trying to be art. You know, like, yeah, there was an understanding with uh, Alfred Hitchcock that cinema was largely doing the same thing as theater had, but that, that's why you may have noticed that um, a lot of the actors and actresses of the early black and white films are basically, um, you know, live theater actors and actresses who are just acting in front of a camera. If you look closely at the credits for the episodes of, say, Alfred Hitchcock Presents or Twilight Zone, it will say based on a short story by such and such, based on a novel by such and such. Um, the relation between the kind of literary art or theatrical art, which really is worthy of the name, and cinema was understood to be pretty close at that time. Cinema is doing the same things as they. It's simply committing it to a recorded medium which can be accessed any time later. That relation really deteriorated over the years to the point that by the 2000s, um, they realized that... Um, they could make a lot more money and they could also produce the material much quicker if they just did away with any attempt to even have it uh, that relation between the literary realm and the cinematic realm maintain. And they just went all the way to, you know, reality TV. And you would flip on the television and see, you know, the Kardashians or, um, you know, true TV in which in which case they're literally just um, automating away the process of recording outrageous stuff because they realize that there are millions of surveillance cameras in enough locations around the world to capture enough instances of uh, robbers getting into fights with store clerks in the middle of the night or um, police car chases or, um, you know, uh, hostage situations with crazed gunmen. Um, there are enough cameras already recording all the time, even before s smartphones were really a thing, that you don't even have to stage any fake fights anymore like you did with The Hills, as Audrina Patridge admitted herself after the last episode had aired, that all of the fights in that show were fake. So you have this um, disconnect between the ideal of this has-to-be art, um, which only grows over time, to the point that eventually it's uh, just a, a pure simulation, which actively negates any uh, attempt to think. Um, you can only really watch something like Jerry Springer and, and chair fighting segments um, on daytime TV or are you the father segments of Maury if you're not thinking. If you think too much, you, you are not even the kind of person who could consume something like that. And I think that's the, the most important criteria to uh, evaluate whether these sort of pre-recorded videos could count as art is the extent to which hermeneutical interpretation plays any role. Now, that admittedly was quite essential for something like the films of Alfred Hitchcock, the films of Fellini, um, some very obscure films from the Czech uh, film industry in the 1960s, which you basically can't even find either on YouTube or on DVD today. 
um, those films were still art because you had to exercise some level of interpretation as a, on a, as a subject in order to draw conclusions about what you had just seen in much the same way that you can only really watch Shakespeare if you're filling in those gaps. Was Macbeth really destined to be the king and the witches were uh, telling him the truth when they made the prediction? Or was it all a farce and he killed the king for no reason and brought about his own uh, demise as a result quite unnecessarily? There really is no straightforward answer. You have to be a thinking subject to watch Macbeth. But um, you have to be precisely not a thinker to watch Keeping Up with the Kardashians, The Hills, or Jerry Springer. So I think that that's a, uh, um, a, a very important distinction which you have to make. But you also mention the Trojan horse's worth of propaganda in which... It's not so much a matter of not thinking at all as it is a matter of not thinking in exactly the right way. Okay, you have this idea that uh, you know um, the purpose of comedy is no longer to be funny. Okay, the purpose of comedy is no longer to um, uh, make clever jokes. Right, um, it's rather just to get people to support the right polit uh, political party, politicians. And uh, policies, which of course are always <laughs> simply a means to get the audience to move further to the left, despite the uh, laughable claim that leftist political activism is the re revolution against the system. Um, comedy at this point is, you know, not even uh, supposed to be funny. It's simply a means to an end to get people to fall into a state of unthinking passivity without hermeneutical interpretation, but in just the right way that happens to support more Democrats being elected. <laughs> and um, that is indeed a problem. It, it, it's not so much that they're trying to get you to think the right way. It's rather that they're trying to get you to not think in exactly the right way. So I think my own um, honest response to this as somebody who used to be very passionate about cinema. My earliest um, YouTube channel back in, uh, say, 2012, for those of you who have been around for that long, you might remember I would wake up in the morning uh, before going to my uh, shift at the factory, and I would have a cup of coffee and record that day's video with only about uh, the bottom half of my face showing I was worried about, you know, you know, releasing my identity to the public uh, back in those days. Um, and I would, I would lar largely talk about films and philosophy. Um, I would I'd talk about, uh, like, Alfred Hitchcock films and Zizek and, and things like that. Um, and, you know, I was, I was definitely someone who, at the beginning of my, uh, you know, uh, career, so to speak, as a YouTube philosopher, um, was largely interested in just doing that sort of philosophical film analysis. But my honest opinion about it now is that if you have great films, almost always they're based on great books. And that's perfectly legitimate, but I think it's not coincidental. I really do think that the story as such, which was great, originated as a great book, a great short story, a great play, etc. Very rare, I think, to find a, a really great film which didn't have some sort of literary prehistory. And of course, you know, um, the uh, YouTube comments will probably contradict me on that, and, and I welcome that sort of discussion. Um, but my own experience, that seems to be the case. So the next question is, I was wondering, what's your take on traditionalist philosophy? He says, I'm sure you're familiar with a lot of thinkers who adhere to forms of traditionalism. Do you think that we can, after having realized that pre-modern men thought differently, actually adopt those ways of thinking? I personally find traditionalism quite problematic because you get to the point of analyzing traditional thought and values precisely because you're already completely separated from them, without any real way to go into that unconscious flow. Real archaic men didn't do things because they were tradition, but rather because that was just what they did. If we do something because it's tradition, we're absurdly into an even more modern position than just going with the flow of our own times. To enter your field, do you think one could escape the deep meme of progress generated by our current culture? Isn't the mere acknowledgement of memological mind structures that which puts you out of them? Or do you remain a part of your particular cultural deep meme 
even after this level of philosophical awareness has been achieved. So I'm going to read a response given by another member of the School of Forbidden Texts um, pretty much immediately after this question was submitted. As you can see with your own eyes, these are pretty much all screenshots from Discord itself because that's where almost all of this sort of discussion is happening now. Another great reason to join the school, by the way. But uh, another member said, I think the central point here is that tradition is not chosen like the arbitrary and hyper-malleable social justice ideology is. Rather, tradition is the essential condition of limitation-bound existence. As such, tradition can only exist if only tradition can exist. In much the same way as Kaczynski states that true freedom is mutually exclusive with the technological system which is hardwired to remove it, the true mindset of tradition is inaccessible without in Hegelian terms, its underlying soma and the registration of its terminus. Traditional social customs are not practiced for some arbitrary aim to oppress or due to some irrational desire to be mean. The traditional life is the life formed by the essential condition of limitation itself. And hermeneutical death and other books are a key influence in my thinking here, says this uh, member of the, the school. This is the exact same thread of argument used by Kaczynski against conservatives who wish to preserve certain aspects of tradition while supporting the exact system which eliminates the possibility of tradition. In many ways, they are analogs to the hipsters and environmentalists who buy products associated with authenticity and eco-friendliness without realizing that the integration of these things into the economic technological system once again precludes them from truly being. Nature does not exist in a natural park. It exists in its unbridled state when it is all that exists, when there is no alternative to it. The same is true of tradition. I dislike talk among certain deep ecology thinkers about which time we should return to, as this smacks of the exact same Promethean hubris, which is itself simply a result of somatic and I would argue spiritual conditions which will rapidly subside after the collapse of the technological system. Whatever follows will not be chosen, but will be mandated by the stress of absolute necessity. Man will have to adapt to his surroundings and will once again be under the formative hammer of ecological limitation and its attendant selective pressures. So to skip ahead to the end of the first question, to enter your field, do you think one could escape the deep meme of progress generated by our current culture is the mere acknowledgement of memological mind structures, that which puts you out of them, or do you remain a part of your particular cultural deep meme even after achieving this level of philosophical awareness? This is um, something which I actually dealt with at the very end of my second book. I noted the paradox that um, the deep meme is, I guess, more real to the person who has no explicit idea that it's there. So the person who um, really believes in progress is the person who has never actually reached the level of consciousness where you have the hermeneutical disclosure of the geometrical shape of the um, linear era of progress as such. The person who really believes in progress is the one for whom that is effectively invisible. I noted the examples um, in my interview with Keith Woods of uh, David Class's Firestorm, a novel by a self-proclaimed uh, environmentalist about um, a boy who travels back a thousand years from the future to warn us that ecological crises will make the future world uninhabitable. But, of course, he uses a time machine to come back to our world, and he's chased by assassins from that same future who use extraordinarily sophisticated devices like ray guns or human animal hybrid monsters or even mind reading abilities, things like that, to try to kill him before he can stop the worst of all futures from happening. But how is it exactly that we have this kind of technological progress even going on in the worst of all possible ecological situations? Um, the uh, thinker who um, takes for granted that progress is going on even <laughs> if the um, biosphere is pushed to the um, breaking point is the one who has no idea that his uh, his own consciousness is structured by the sending arrow. He has no idea that that's even there because he simply takes it for granted. And that's why contradictions of, of this sort can go completely unnoticed. You see the same thing with another even more ridiculous uh, dystopian science fiction novel called The Doors You Mark Are Your Own about 
the mutually exclusive themes of extreme water shortage and alcoholism. Um, somehow, a society where uh, people are too poor to afford water is also one where they can drink as much cheap beer as they possibly want, even if they don't even have a job. We're never told how they're able to do that because the people who wrote this book never bothered to spend just two minutes researching the topic online, in which case they'd find that some 154 liters of water have to be wasted just to produce one liter of beer. But in addition to the ecological impossibility of this, which I emphasize a lot in uh, my, my fifth book on Linkola, there's also the memological problem, which is um, even in a dystopian book, which is supposed to be also about environmental catastrophe of running out of water, we still have all of the expectations of a world of progress, specifically on the economic level, that even the poorest <laughs> you know, person in society can still spend all of their time getting wasted on really cheap beer, which is, however you look at it, simply the um, deep meme of fossil fuels in disguise. And I think it's most real precisely for people who've never reached that level of consciousness. I mentioned in my early work that you kind of start at the most shallow level of consciousness in mythology. We're all really mostly dwelling in the realm of mythology where you have emotionally compelling images situated within a story oriented towards resolving some conflict to reach a happy ending. Jordan Peterson noted that even on a neuroscientific level, you can explain how this is basically how humans have to function. Because if we weren't um, seeing ourselves as being on a path to some idealized future state of happiness, quite frankly, we wouldn't be able to live. Life wouldn't be worth living if we didn't think that that's, that was where we were headed. So we mostly dwell there at the shallowest layer of mythology. Um, the next shallowest is of course that of systems you have you know impressive work in uh, various uh, you know mathematical etc systems uh, by people who still have no idea that their thought process is structured by the deep meme of progress because that is the i guess the fourth shallowest you have to go um, all the way through uh, three uh, other layers to get to that fourth layer of the deep meme and of course the deepest um, layer is that of the soma itself in which you're not even registering the geometrical metaphor of fossil fuels you're simply registering the somatic presence itself but of course if you do that um, you can only really be registering the somatic layer if you register it as limitation if you um, register water for example as just another object on the planet arrakis or rather if you um, register beer as just another cons uh, cheap consumer item in the world of the doors you mark are your own um, <laughs> then you're not really reached the somatic layer you're still in the the third layer of a counter sense object you only really reach the, th the layer of um, the soma if you register it as the deepest limit to that worldview um, and of course that takes us to the second question about whether um, the uh, tradition of Julius Evola, René Guénon, etc., is also kind of like the ecological limitations involved in SOMA. Just as seeing the deep meme of progress as such is something like a deconstruction of it, in that after you have this experience of reaching the memeological layer, you'll never really be able to see mythological or systematic or objective expressions of progress, which are always less clear than the purified deep meme itself. You'll never be able to take those as seriously. If you hear something like a proposal to uh, turn the world into a green campus in which, by the way, people's thoughts on um, unrelated social and political issues also progress in addition to their environmental um, habits supposedly progress. Um, you can never take that bullshit seriously ever again after you realize the um, unconscious uh, memological shape which underlies it. It's only the people who've never reached that layer that will hear something like that and actually um, assume that that's simply uh, a, a proof of its being or reality that it embodies this logic of progress. Because as I mentioned in my interview with Keith Woods, um, Hegel noted that uh, most people who haven't been able to do philosophy have still been able to have the absolute disclosed but within the medium of art. And we take for granted um, even today that there's not that many people who do philosophy, but we have more professional philosophers alive today than the rest of history combined. And by that, I largely mean like professors. We have more people who make their salary at a university teaching 
philosophy now than like all the um, uh, preceding eras of human history combined had philosophers, and we still don't have very many of them, right? Um, it was interesting that on the first day of, you know, attending Philosophy 100, like 11, 12 years ago, when I was in undergrad, um, the first day of class for this general class with about 100 people, professor said, uh, could anyone in this room name even one 21st century philosopher? And the only response was one guy raised his hand and said, Sigmund Freud who was from the 19th century, which is just, you know, two centuries <laughs> too early. So um, it's interesting that uh, most people have not done philosophy, but they've still had a, a sort of folk metaphysics for Hegel, um, at least within his lectures on fine arts, you kind of um, get to have the absolute disclosed hermeneutically within art, which is democratically accessible. Not everybody uh, basically can read Aristotle or Plato, let alone Hegel himself, but everybody can, you know, see the art of um, Rembrandt or Shakespeare or Mozart, etc. And I would go actually even further than Hegel and say, no, 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 the, the kind of folk metaphysics which is accessible to everyone is just the deep memes themselves. And those are specific to which ecological context that person actually dwells within. It's not a coincidence that being qua being for the average person today simply is, a, you know, the arrow of progress because there's uh, registering the presence of fossil fuels, but a millennium ago, being qua being meant for uh, many people, the agrarian circle, because they were registering the presence of agrarian grain. But if they were nomadic herdsmen, it was uh, being qua being was the set. Um, if they were hunter gatherers, being qua being is a level plane. And of course, in the future, being qua being will be the, the bell curve of salvage. Unless, of course, human extinction comes first. We'll have to see about that. But um, this idea that you can only really... Um, go beyond progress if you actually explicitly recognize it, not just as the sort of folk metaphysics of that's what being is, but rather as the deep meme itself, in which case you realize that it's only one of six. And by the way, in which case you realize that being qua being is not fossil fuels, despite the way that my own philosophy has kind of maybe been slightly misunderstood by people saying, oh, being qua being is just oil. No, being qua being is limitation. And you can only really realize that that is the case if you have this sort of systematic deconstruction of fossil fuels, this moment of realizing, oh, that is just one of six perfectly legitimate, but of course, distinct uh, deep memes, which are all really um, the result of a certain ecological context, which is itself only really understood as a context of ecological limitation. And the question whether this also works for tradition, um, do the modern thinkers who try to mimic the traditions of the ancient world also basically reveal the, the lack of being which it has precisely because they explicitly realize that these are just traditions which are contingent in the same way that the deep memes are and that they are a way of life perhaps but only one of many that have existed within history rather than the only way things could be which is kind of how we sort of understand the ancient um, uh, people to have understood these traditions to be as that's just you know basically being qua being in the same way that the deep memes are is it really the same so the first question is really asking whether it's even possible to still choose to live tradition even after you have this deconstructive moment of realizing its contingency and worse yet realizing that it is not an organic or spontaneous expression of your own worldview but is rather something you can only at best artificially restore through imitating um, you know the extant <laughs> literature of the ancient world to the um, very limited extent that uh, such things are even accessible to us or preserved. Um, the question is can you still choose to live it even though it will not be felt as having the same level of reality or being that it did for the ancient person for whom it was more real precisely because um, it was taken for granted as just the way things are rather than as tradition as such. And of course, the second question began by responding that any talk of choosing tradition in that sense is basically treating it the way that uh, modern SJWs treat their own arbitrary and hypermalleable um, ideology. It seems absolute, of course, at the moment, because the people who willingly chose to choose it <laughs> um, are, uh, of course, only seeking to demonstrate 
their own uh, purity on a moral level, and the people who don't happen to know the current sequence of letters following after LGB or the current number of genders as decided by some professional gender theorist on an Ivy League university making six figures for no deeper reason than that. Um, the people who don't know that because it is not literally their job um, as a part of a corporate bureaucracy or a political party or academic industry um, entity uh, to know this bullshit, um, they are guilty not just of ignorance, although certainly that, but also of having failed on a moral level to choose the right ideology, which of course seems absolute despite the fact that it constantly changes precisely in order to exclude those people. It's not a coincidence, therefore, that traditionalist philosophers like Evola and Dina identify at least the following two trends as signs of precisely this sort of decline away from tradition. The first is an obsession with language as such, um, not language in relation to the absolute spiritual truths of the world of tradition or uh, language in relation to ecological context, etc., just language on its own. And this is not only um, what you find, you know, the quote-unquote rabble think about, but even like the greatest intellectuals of an era, like the, the top philosophers. Evola noted that even with like Socrates and Plato, you see this. Um, even with Kant, you see this obsession with language in the form of how is experience subsumed under the concept in order for it to be understood. And this only gets much worse in the 20th century when academic philosophy departments simply throw up their hands and say, we're not allowed to do anything except language because even the phenomenological account of human experience is now fit only for neuroscientists. They alone can tell us how the brain functions as a biological machine for consciousness to appear. The only thing we have left is to go through all of the wonderful ways that language can be used properly to further the uh, political cause of bringing about a modern democratic state, says people like Habermas. Um, Evola and Genon noted that this obsession with language as such, the linguistic turn, there is no uh, measure of, of value or truth beyond language, certainly not anything spiritual or anything ecological. It's simply language on its own. That's a sign of this sort of decline away from tradition. Um, but the other thing you see is uh, moralism and this obsession with morality over dogma was emphasized by Dina, um, even within Christianity itself. In the medieval era, uh, the Roman Catholic Church was interested in um, getting access to these sort of foundational eternal spiritual truths, which don't depend on any one person's maybe feelings about it. They're simply um, absolute dogmatic truths in the most literal sense of that term. Uh, but with the Protestant Reformation and the succeeding centuries afterwards, you find Christianity become less and less concerned, says Genau, with that, and more and more a matter of, well, how does a religious experience make me feel? You have to also really mean it on the inside, says Zizek. Um, you have to really not harbor any negative feelings about certain groups, and you have to really harbor negative feelings about certain other groups for which it is your ethical duty to really hate them, really passionately feel and undergo these experiences of these sorts of emotions. Um, and that is, of course, just a means to an end to uh, justify your own access to a first world standard of living with all of its financial, ecological, and fossil fuel costs in an era in which automation has made it impossible for you to justify it through any of the work that you can actually do. It's quite interesting that the only reason to spend six years on a college campus as a full-time SJW, even to the point that um, a group of students at Brown um, formally petitioned the dean um, to exempt them from taking their exams because they were spending so much time in leftist political activism that they didn't have time to study. And I think they were actually granted that exemption because it was an understanding that you're not really here to learn whatever boring bullshit they're trying to test you on in that class. You're here to do the political activism. And what's the reason for that? Hmm, students at Ivy League University, I think they might be trying to get high-paying corporate or government jobs after graduation. After all, how are they going to pay off six figures of student loans for being on a college campus for six years? And how are they going to um, justify the, getting those high-paying jobs and the affluent lifestyles it affords them <laughs> um, if they don't really know any knowledge because they didn't actually go to class or take tests? Oh, they can justify it only because they not only know the right words or rather choose to use them, but they also harbor the right feelings on the inside in a purely 
private and sentimental sense as well. It's quite ironic that the critiques um, a century ago, which might have been leveled against uh, Protestant, you know, fundamentalist Christians, are now really relevant to the exact opposite. A bunch of secular, so-called rationalist, far-left <laughs> SJWs. And that is indeed the very worst example of the kind of decline away from tradition, as this comment um, correctly noted. So the idea that um, a tradition isn't about choosing, let alone something which is only trending right now for arbitrary um, reasons of uh, social popularity, right, um, is, uh, I think, a very good point. But um, the uh, question also notes that the true mindset of tradition is inaccessible without its soma. Now, I'm guessing by that that um, the uh, it's meant that the soma is not that of fossil fuels. <laughs> so uh, maintaining fossil fuels and tradition, which is basically like the ideology of like, let's just say like your mainstream Republican conservative in the United States, they really want things like family to still be valued or things like uh, heteronormative monogamy within marriage, or I don't know, things like going to church every Sunday and, and saying your prayers and, and believing in the Bible as an infallible text with uh, a divine origin. They want to believe these things, but they want to maintain the fossil fuels and the deep meme of progress too. They want to just not be that person, but also the kind of member of the church community who has a good enough job that he can write a big check every week to the church. He can write a big check every week to a dozen different um, uh, charity organizations. He can send his kids to some prestigious out-of-state Christian university, whatever, and I'm not really trying to be too harsh on th uh, th these sorts of people in, in like a stupid like leftist SJW sense, um, but I am saying that this expectation that you can maintain these sort of outer forms of tradition, which were inherited from an earlier era in say like the Middle Ages or even earlier, but still be that sort of fossil fuel person who it fits the ideal, the, uh, the memeology, I should say, of progress. You're still one of the uh, people within the society whose salary is rising because you were able to get a good job along with, you know, all the other people working um, within uh, certain corporate government and uh, et cetera bureaucracies, um, while the rest of the population uh, basically uh, drowns in debt and stagnating wages and uh, job losses from outsourcing and automation. This is something which obviously might seem to work for a few decades, whatever, but is completely unsustainable in the long run. And it really falls into the same problem of you're living a context in which the fossil fuels and the deep meme of progress are what's really real. But of course, you still have to choose the right exterior forms of what looks kind of like tradition. And you have to feel a certain way about it. It's like I, I um, eventually reached the point of, I know that I, I can't um, proof um, any of this, but I still feel it is a very common um, sort of response that you will find a modern person who fits this sort of thing. The, the idea that, uh, you know, I can't actually provide any deeper evidence for why my ways of doing things are right, except the feelings that it gives me that it must be, okay? And that is, however well-intentioned it might be, just another sign of the same kind of decline into materialism and linguistification, which ironically is embodied even better by the secularist SJWs. So I'll just finish uh, my response to this by addressing the idea that this is just the same Promethean hubris which is a result of certain somatic and even spiritual conditions, which will rapidly subside after the collapse of the technological system. In other words, the idea of having the kind of Promethean freedom to use technology to do the right things, even to use technology in a very perverse sense to bring back tradition. You could imagine some sort of bizarre project to seize the power of technological agency in a kind of Georgianian sense to bring about the sort of um, pseudo-traditional society in which all of the things I just mentioned, you know, the extended family, the belief in the sacred um, authorship of, of the text, uh, the, the need to go through the daily spiritual rituals. You could imagine someone trying to engineer just such a situation without realizing um, that the um, uh, collapse of the fossil fuel deep meme, the collapse of the, collapse of the technological system is the only thing which could allow tradition to return as something which is not just 
a set of linguistic labels which are chosen and which you feel a certain passionate way about as being the only uh, standards for returning to it, but rather really felt to be real. And I do think that if human extinction doesn't come first, the, 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 the post-fossil fuel era will indeed be just such a time. Um, you won't have this campaign to maybe force people or convince people to choose these things. They will simply be registered as every bit as real as we take for granted today the underlying deep need. So next question is, in your opinion, who is the most radical um, anti-technological philosopher and why? This is a really great question um, because there are um, a number of people who are, of course, opposed to technology in a really serious sense. Um, but the question of which one of them is the most anti-technological, I think, has to be answered in a very specific way. And that is, who is the person who does not consider technology to be merely subordinate um, to some other bigger problem. So obviously, I would not consider John Zerzan to be the most anti-technological philosopher because for him, technology is just another example of the same underlying problem of agricultural domestication, which you can find as early as, I don't know, he talks about like 30,000 years ago, you start to see symbolic thought because you start to see the very beginnings of domestication. I don't think John Zerzan is um, a properly anti-technological philosopher in the sense of um, value or uh, recognizing what's going on right now as being... Um, categorically different from which we had like 30,000, 10,000 years ago, um, which it certainly is. For him, as soon as you commit the original sin of domesticating an animal, you've already fallen into um, the state of, well, once again, original sin, much like Christianity, um, which I think his own thought process, quite frankly, is more indebted to than it might seem. So uh, John Zerzan is not, because for him, there's really not that much of a qualitative difference between, you know, like an ancient um, nomadic tribe, which is herding sheep, which is technically domestication, but otherwise they pretty much don't use technology, and the kind of humanoids you have today who um, are, for all intents and purposes, largely not even hermeneutical subjects. There's a huge difference there, which I think Zerzan... Um, doesn't quite provide the intellectual resources to address. You also have thinkers who note that um, the very fixation on technology is kind of misguided. You have uh, peak oil thinkers like James Howard Kunstler who said, look, technology is nothing in itself except ways of burning fossil fuels, which is true in a certain sense. Um, and then Michael Rupert, of course, uh, mentioning that um, the laws of thermodynamics would lead you to talk much more clearly about energy rather than about this or that technology as such. But the danger of this overemphasis on peak oil, um, which is something people have over the years also you know, brought up with regard as a, as a kind of flaw in my own early thinking, is that if you simply write it off as euphemisms for energy, um, which uh, you know the, the laws of thermodynamics will tell you why it can't be sustained and therefore you don't have to worry about it is basically Michael Rupert's response is, well, we're going to run out of that level of energy anyway. And he noted in 2009 in Confronting Collapse that, you know, the things that I have been predicting for years we'll see unfold within the next months or perhaps even weeks. He was a little bit misguided to say it in quite that way because, of course, here we are you know, 12 years later, and much of what he talked about has still not really come to pass, because you have to deal with technology on its own terms. And I think the, the most anti-technological philosophers are precisely the ones who try to do that. Um, to, to name a couple of quick examples of people who, who don't really quite fit that, uh, Penty Linkola, you know, the, the f technology is nothing except ecological impossibility, which of course has no being, therefore it's merely secondary to the problem of ecology. John, John Michael Greer in many ways fits into this problem too. He notes that um, the technological system will collapse in the same, for the same reasons that a group of field mice who eat up a surplus of grain that fell from a truck that crashed on the side of the road um, will also have their populations decline over time. The people who, I think, really do justice to why technology has its own uh, logic, which really cannot be subordinated to anything else, are, of course, Ted Kaczynski and Jacques Ellul. The question of which one of them is more anti-technological? Well, you know, quite frankly, you know, Ted Kaczynski's actions um, 
kind of speak for themselves. And that is something which has to be considered. I just thought I would mention that. Uh, but of course, you know, Jacques Ellul is pretty anti-technological himself because he doesn't buy arguments about, oh, we found coal first. And then this, um, you know, very different way of viewing the world uh, followed afterwards. He said, no, 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 we had this way of viewing the world, which allowed that coal to be put to use for technical reasons, which only progressed in efficiency rapidly over time because it was following the logic of technique rather than simply uh, disclosing the phenomenological presence of fossil fuels, to use my own terms, admittedly. So I think the most anti-technological philosopher is um, the, the ones who don't play games with only saving the good technologies and um, only getting rid of the bad ones. <laughs> um, the kind of philosophers like uh, Kaczynski, who um, are willing to challenge even things as sacrosanct as modern hygiene. Wow, there are a few things people would find quite as offensive as the idea that you should wash your hands whenever they get dirty to avoid getting sick. Um, and uh, Kaczynski is one of the, the people who's willing to push it that far, along with Linkola, of course. Um, and I think that uh, the, the standard of who's the most anti-technological philosopher uh, really has to come down probably to two, the, these two guys. And of course, finally, hey, Chad, would love to hear your thoughts on Biden's new climate change initiatives. Also, for some easy cannon fodder, you might have fun addressing the main criticism that people have of it. Nothing to do with climate, ecology, or even energy, but rather the complaint that people will lose their jobs. So I tried to research this. I'll be 100% honest with you. I don't really follow the news anymore. Um, there was a time when I really enjoyed reading a daily local newspaper here in India. There was even a time when I enjoyed um, uh, reading a newspaper in America. I would be uh, driving my, uh, my, my uh, routes as a medical courier all over Denver, and sometimes I'd have a free moment, so I'd pull over into a 7-Eleven and spend $1 for like a USA Today. I used to really enjoy the uh, experience of reading a newspaper far more, of course, than you know the 24-7 uh, clickbait um, simulation of social media news, which, by the way, if you, if you haven't... Um, left like Facebook, for example, please do. <laughs> please um, allow the rest of your life to be like 10 times longer because if you're not wasting all of your time with that, um, you'll be amazed how much more you can do with your life. So um, I, I, I used to enjoy the newspapers, but about a year ago, even that became a form of drudgery because every day you'd open up the news and all you would hear was the current numbers of you know what and a lot of other really bad news. And um, the bias was absolutely astounding. Even out here in India, where nobody here can actually vote in the U.S. election, it was it's just outrageous how um, distorted and biased uh, the reporting on the events was, even on things like riots, like even um, all the way out here in India, um, if there was, uh, uh, you know, uh, something bad done by rioters, they would never tell you. But um, if there was something bad done by people who opposed rioters, it would make like the front page news. It's absolutely ridiculous how coordinated this is. So I haven't been following the news, but I can tell you that to the extent that I researched this on my own, it's a bunch of, to the extent I understand it, promises that we're no longer going to drill we're, uh, on, on, on federal lands. We're no longer going to frack on federal lands, blah, blah, blah. And to be honest with you, um, I don't really see how that's, going to make much of any kind of a difference because if you don't have any concrete proposals for how people are going to use less energy by of course using tools which would be considered out of date today which of course that is not even an option in this plan it's not really going to make any difference what this will probably do is cause certain people to lose their jobs who you know quite frankly probably um, will be used for other purposes afterwards. Like uh, Dmitry Orlov speculated that if you have enough people thrown out of work intentionally and then thrown out of their apartments and then you make it illegal to loiter, well, suddenly you have all of this free labor for the prison system. And it's funny how with all these technological innovations, it still really is the case that the most efficient source of labor is just human labor. So, um, and, you know, from a deep ecology perspective, is this proof uh, that the new administration is really environmentalist? Of course not. <laughs> this is just more bullshit from the Democrat Party and the media and Hollywood celebrities to try to look virtuous um, without, of course, actually going beyond anything to do with uh, the deep meme of fossil fuels. So um, I, I, in a certain sense, I wish I had more to say about this, but I, I just I don't feel that there's really that much of substance here.
Um, and this is just another example of why the very term environmentalism has to be done away with in favor of terms that are far more meaningful. 